Hey, my brothers and sisters, I'd like to welcome you to JCC Sunday Schools in Session, where Sunday School matters to God. Please like, subscribe, and leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Our lesson is coming from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and it is titled, Jesus' First Miracle. We're getting started on a new unit today, getting to know Jesus. Many times we read the Gospels, and we read them from a historical point of view, but the gospel has so much more to offer us. They reveal to us a spiritual manifestation of God and his plan. The gospel of John reveals Christ's deity and his messiahship. The first open public display of his deity and the messiahship as this miracle shows us his plan of redemption. I know I'm challenging many people's theology, and I pray you allow me to show you this in the lesson. As we look to answer our first four questions from these first four verses, our first question asks, what was the occasion? Where was it taking place? And who was included among the guests? Let's read verses 1 and 2 to find the answers. Verse 1 and 2 read, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. We see the occasion was a wedding that is taking place in Cana of Galilee. Now, we spoke last week in our lesson where Jesus calls uh, Philip and Nathaniel to say the significance of Galilee as it is linked to a Hebrew word refers to revelation. And this is known throughout the Bible as a place where spiritual revelation occurs. Things of a spiritual nature are usually revealed when the scripture reference this place. For more, please go back to that lesson we did last week to kind of get a better insight of it. Those in the tennis were Christ's mother, not mentioned by name, but it was Mary, Christ himself, and his disciples. Jesus shows us, John shows us this, and this is significant for us as well. First, the mentioning of Mary, his mother, indicates that there was either a family member wedding or a very close friend of the family. But also we see her name here emphasized in the scripture by the order in the text. Order is significant as we study the word and also interpret that word. So John was showing us that she is to be emphasized here in this here portion of the lesson. Why? When a woman is emphasized in scripture, it points to redemption. An example of this is when the midwives mentioned in Exodus, they feared the Lord more than Pharaoh. And as a result, we see redemption on the part of the people of God. So the mentioning of Mary before Christ in this second verse is to illustrate this here is signifying redemption. Many may not believe me, but I challenge you to study this here for yourself. Second, it sets the stage for the young disciple to be revealed by the nature of Christ. These here young disciples are now going to receive a revelation about the true nature of who Christ really is. Question two asks, what Jesus attends at the wedding teaches us? It teaches us that Christ values the sanctity of marriage. Christ is accessible and willing to be available to share his life with others in a marriage setting. We know Christ's work of preparing to redeem the world was extremely important, but he shows us the the value of marriage. He shows us the power of relationship and how this can be an impact on others. Even during these times, we still can share a word from God pray for others, and maybe understand and see their situation and be able to intercede for them. Let us never neglect the importance of building relationship in our preparation of as disciples of Christ. As we build relationship with family, our first ministry is our home and abroad. Always look to build a relationship as this is significant as the bride of Christ the church. Again, when we go in and look at this here as Christ's attendance, as he valued the sanctity of marriage, we see how it also brings into play the church, our place of being in position to go in and bring about the necessities of life to help people to come in to the fold to also be a part of the body of Christ. Verse 3 and 4 says, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not yet come. Our next set of questions asks, why was Mary so concerned with the host when they, as they ran out of wine? In this, these times, this would bring about serious embarrassment and shame to the hosting family. This would have brought about negativity on the family. So Mary shows us 
her concern for the family's reputation. Notice how Christ responds. He responds by letting us see here what is meant by the, my hour has not yet come. He responds by saying woman versus mother. Now, many may think this is a term of disrespect, but this is a term of respect. It is like we say ma'am to our mother out of respect. And we see here, this is what Christ is using to respect his mother versus disrespect him. When Christ says my hour, which is uh, not yet come, what he's trying to say is that saving work he does to restore the relationship between humanity and God has not yet come. It's because God alone determines when Christ is to be revealed to the world through this here plan of redemption, not a family member or anyone else. This belongs solely to God to make this revelation of Christ being revealed to the world. We always wait on God's time, and as we learn, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall fly on wings of eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. This encourages my brothers and sisters to wait on God and his time. Our next four questions ask us, what did Mary tell the servants to do? Why were they large pots represented at the wedding? What does Christ tell the servants to do? And why was it important to fill them to the brim? Let's read verses 5 through 8 to find the answers to these questions and begin to discuss. Verse 5 through 8 read, His mother said unto the servant, Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. And there were set there six pots stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkin apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. These verses tell us Mary told the servants, Do whatever Christ says to do. Mary is indicating to us that Christ will do just what he said he would do. We just have to be obedient. But in our lives today, it also brings a great point that we need to indicate. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly in our needs, to go in and take care of the things that we need. We all face dilemmas. We all face difficulties in this life. And our problem is that we tend to worry and search for our way to fix the problem instead of turning to God, the problem solver, to fix our problem. We see Mary did a powerful thing here in coming to Jesus. The same dilemma that we need to do today. We need to look at this here as a church, as a body of Christ, and look to the hills from which cometh our help and know that our help comes from the Lord. As we look at this here spiritually, there is also a need which we need to address about the wine. Wine in the Bible, it symbolizes great love and great joy. John is revealing to us the lack of love and great joy that lacks in the nation. Again, remember, I want to show you that the gospel of John is always trying to signify the deity and the messiahship of Christ. So we tend in times to look for love and, and great joy in persons and places and things and we never really can find a thing that fills that void in us until we do like the servants, whatever Christ asks us to do. If we want to experience unconditional love, unspeakable joy, all we need is to accept the way of redemption that God plans prescribed, and we will experience the best at the last days of our lives. So we see the wine takes us back to Amos. If you will go to Amos, the ninth chapter, and read verses 11 through 13, you will go back and you will see that this symbolizes the kingdom of David. And we show that it will flow with wine, indicating restoration to the nation. Here, in this here, John is trying to symbolize us the restoration aspect of Messiah coming on the scene as the one who's going to bring us back into covenant relationship with God. These stone pots would have been used for ceremonial purification and would have represented cleansing. Stone was said to keep the water free from impurities. Verse 6 is important for us to understand as it represents a verse of grace. This is always throughout Scripture, the relationship between grace and redemption. As we know, without grace, there can be no redemption. So we see the divine purpose of God by these verses, showing us these six stone jars being placed to reveal the grace of God in that matter. Now, these jars contain water, which was to be used again, the purification of the people. Please see this. Christ is going to use what was to be used for purification to meet a need. Please don't see this in the physical, but the spiritual. 
as the gospel of John purpose is to reveal to us again the deity and the purpose of Christ's earthly ministry and messiahship. We know with God all things are possible. So if Christ wanted to merely provide wine, he could have spoke a word and wine would have appeared. Or it could have been a knock at the door and someone miraculously delivering wine. This didn't happen, but John is trying to reveal to us a purpose of Christ for this passage. That is that he would bring about the change we need for redemption through grace. It is through the wine, spiritually speaking, we can experience the love and joy that the marriage brings about between us and, and our Savior. See, this marriage is a symbol of the church relationship with Christ. We need to be purified to enjoy the grace of God and all that it has to offer. Christ tells them to fill them up to the brim in verse 7. Six stone water pots would have equaled 120 to 180 gallons. This seems like an exaggerated amount, but it shows us that God's presence and God's grace now flows to the world, to the church, to the brim. God always gives the abundant with an abundance. Again, going back to Amos 9, referring to that restoration being established, confirming God's promise that Christ is that ruler and redeemer that's going to come in and fulfill that need, that necessary little need for us to come back in, be in God's presence, and receive the grace of God. Question 9 asks, how does the governor respond upon receiving the water that had been changed into wine by Jesus? Let's read verse 9 and 10 and see. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made with wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servant which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto them, Every man at the beginning do have set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine unto now. The answer to that question is he responded in excitement. He was amazed that the bridegroom did the opposite, as he says most people bring out the best first, and then the inferior one, as their taste buds become dull. As we look at this here spiritually, the spiritual implications of this is going back to the symbolism of the wine being joy and love. When we first fall in love with someone or something, that which brings us joy has a tendency after a time to lose its savor. But when we experience the provisions of God in our redemption, it will be better than the first. God's love and joy is the, of the highest quality. See, when our marriage to Christ, meaning that, again, that body of Christ, the church, is brought under submission, we say the same thing, that the best love and joy of our spiritual life is better than before. It's only him who can make the best get better and better and better. We have a saying that the wine gets better with time, so what is this teaching us as we refer to the water to wine is when we seek him in our purification process, we will manifest joy and love of, of God's glory in our lives in his covenant relationship. And it will get better and better and better with time. Question 10 asks us, what was the miracle intended to accomplish and what were the results? Let's read verse 11 and find the answer. Verse 11 says, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifest his glory and his disciples believed on him. Why does John emphasize Galilee again? Because we know Galilee is symbolizing spiritual revelation. The miracle revealed this miraculous power of Jesus, which points to him as the son of God. It reveals his glorious identity. It reveals he is the source of love and joy. It reveals also his redemptive work of purification which will bring about that love and joy for him. It is the way we, we will see what's the best before us and not behind us because the best is always in front of us for a child of God. Just as we talked about earlier, as wine is better with time, our spiritual lives will also be better with time. As we look forward to that day when we come into the presence of God as a body of believers, our best brothers and sisters, is yet to come. It shows us also that Cana is the hour had not come, but at the cross, the hour comes by his death. Brought about, and this here brought about the revelation of redemption. At Cana, he gives us the best wine, but at the cross, he will complete his ministry by drinking the sour wine. 
Cana reveals his divine power of love, but the cross reveals the depths of his divine power of love for us. Through all this, God received the glory he deserved. Notice this last part. This caused his disciples to put their faith and trust in him. See, in the golden text, we learn that the purpose of this is not that Jesus does miracles, but to show us how Christ wins people to faith in him. As the Son of God, by believing we might have life through his name, there is no greater joy than to be saved by grace through the faith in Jesus Christ. As a result of turning the water into wine, Christ's disciples believed on him. God used Moses to turn water into blood as a sign of judgment in Egypt. And we see Christ turn water into wine as a sign of celebration, of joy, and love. We learn through this here matter the redemptive aspects of God. We can learn if that we accept Christ into our lives, he can turn a disaster into a delight a bitter enemy into a believing disciple, or a sinner into saints. My brothers and sisters, I pray that you have received what I was trying to give you today. In that spiritual revelation, if we look at this here passage just by reading it as a historical event, you're going to miss all the spiritual insight that God is trying to reveal to us. I pray that I did not go in and question your theology, but all what I hope that I did was help your theology to see that this passage is very relevant to all the things that we need to do from a redemptive perspective, how we need Christ, how we need that purification, how we need to be uh, uh, brought in and receive him, receive what he gives us in order to enjoy, to have that unspeakable joy that he brings to our lives. Again, this has been a great lesson. I hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have, please leave us a message. Let us know. Until next week, you all be blessed now. Amen.